Hello everybody and welcome back to the Agostino Zingo Show episode number 95 with me, your host Agostino. How are you? How are you doing? How's your week been? Oh great, amazing. And me? Ah, great, you know, you know how I am man. I'm always on top of the world, always feeling nice and healthy and alive and fucking fit and healthy, right? Now I'm feeling good, it's been a great week already, it's fucking spun by for me. Um, m- mostly because I've been, you know, I've been keeping myself on my toes. I've been working out a lot. I've been doing loads of shits on the side. I've been preparing some mixes. I've been writing on my blog every single day. We should check it out. Default Goon, Default Goon, Default Goon. Google it, you'll find it. Um, I've been doing all that sort of stuff. It's kind of made the the weeks pass me by in an absolute flash, right? But I'm feeling good. I'm feeling fine. Um, I had a long run this morning. Well, not a long run, a semi-long run, four miles and a half. And I felt really, really good. I'm starting to get my average mile time down each after each run. I'm now hovering around the 8.40, 8.50 mile per mark. I'm trying to get it down hopefully to about 8 or 8.20. And it's funny because um, with your Nike running app, it's quite depressing, but also quite encouraging to see how far, quote unquote, fast I was back in the day. But it's weird because at that time I had no point of reference, right? Because I was so overweight. When I started to find lose weight and I started to run, I just thought the time I was running was a normal time to run. I didn't realize that I was running quickly. So if I look back on my um, Nike running app, especially when I started to lose a lot of weight, this is like 2014 um, times when I kind of ran my first half marathon, I was running, I was doing 10Ks, average pace of like 7.45, sometimes 7.30. Like I was blitzing it. And my five, and my 5K time was like, I think, I think I did a 5K in 23 minutes. And this is like running through the streets. So I might have to stop in traffic. That's why I saw stuff is fairly quick. So I'm trying to hopefully get to that back to that marker. Um, as always, when, when you get when you get older, it gets a little bit harder to do these kind of things. But the more you incorporate some sort of like physical activity, uh, especially a daily thing that you do kind of like from Monday to Friday at the least, right? 30 minutes to an hour of some sort of physical exercise. It, it does help to keep you in prim proper shape. And couple that with um, most of my diet apart from today which is uh, sponsored by some sort of alcoholic beverages but usually uh, most of my week is spent eating qu- pretty clean so i have like you know usually just eggs and some bacon in the morning I-, I usually fast before i work out too which is another good um little point to point out i do like a 16 hour fast every single day using the app called zero um which is made by kevin rose formerly of dig which you check that out it's a free app on ios i'm not sure if it's available on android but check it it's called zero so z-e-r-o and I use that to track my fasting. It's a very simple app. You kind of um, you kind of select what kind of fasting um, program you want to work with. Um, I think there's some that start with 10 hours, 13, 14, 16. I'm doing 16 hours. So you basically uh, press the button when you want to start, when you've had your last meal. And then when you're about to eat your first meal of the, new, of the next day after the, the kind of time has elapsed, then you kind of press stop fasting and it kind of tracks it. And now I'm kind of working roughly. I would fast uh, before I have my, I will fast during my, fir- my first workout, so I won't eat anything, I'll just have some water, I won't even have a coffee, nothing, because it doesn't really work for me that well, it doesn't sit well for me, because I remember one time I went to, went to Berlin um, to go visit a mate, and I had a coffee without eating anything, and I thought I nearly died, um, which wasn't a good, <laughs> I don't suggest it, I finally figured out, you know, everyone's got different metabolism, or everyone's got like a different body type, some people can, can drink coffee and not eat anything, right? And I'm not that guy, unfortunately. I discovered that um, painfully standing inside some... Well, I think it was a... Was there a vegan place? I think it might have been a vegan falafel place I was standing inside. And I was having a shake, sweating all over the gaff, feeling like I was going to faint. So I'm never going to do that again. Uh, and what else? So yeah, so I don't I don't eat or anything before I go and work out. And I usually have my first meal about 8 or 9 a.m. And I have my lunch at about half four. Half, my lunch slash... Uh, dinner i kind of have two meals a day essentially i have like eggs and bacon in the morning with some coffee and i usually have a bit of lemon water so i get get a glass and just squeeze a bit of lemon in there um and then i'll for lunch i'll have like a big caesar salad like which is you know it's annoying because i have the same thing every day but you know it kind of um takes out any decision fatigue so i don't want to overly think about what i'm going to eat especially for like especially if i'm doing this for the end of august i've got these little micro goals i want to do i want to reach a certain weight by the end of the end of august or august 31st so it's best I just kind of stick to like a a, uh, a rudimentary, really boring, um, samey, samey um, eating plan. And then what, when uh, the new month starts in September, I can kind of, you know, review what I've ate, see what I like, see what I didn't like, and then go and head off and get a new meal plan. But I'm not really a fan of changing your meals every single week, man. So boring. So boring. I could think of much. I've, I could think of much better things to do in my life. Honestly, I swear to God, it's it's one of the most boring things I've seen in my life. But actually preparing the meals and having the fucking Tupperwares laid out, 
and them looking so awesome and all nice and organized i fucking love that i think that's so beautiful like on that on that sunday when you get all your meal prep prepared and you're about to put it all in the fridge and shit and you need to organize so i think it's so good like now actually our fridge looks amazing our fridge is just full of like tupperwares for the week and like little, so little bits and bobs that you're gonna eat for the weekend so for the most part we don't have any real like shitty snacks in the house that's gonna kind of uh, result in any sort of trouble dietary trouble at least but that's been what i've been doing majorly for the week and we're not going to spend too much time waffling on in the intro because i've listened to a few other podcasts and i've noticed you know the things that you've noticed other people's podcasts that you hate but then you do it on your own i'm not going to do that anymore so i'm not going to waste too much time waffling on this topic of my dietary plans you know what it is you know what i do you know the work that i put in out here so yeah, let's get right into the topic. So we've got a whole bunch of them that I want to run through. And since you know, it's an off day, it might be a good time to get into some good ones. All right, number one. Henry Rowland, driven by anger. And I told you so, right? The chip on your shoulder. This has been something I've been thinking about for a while, right? Uh, oh, which is general ambition. Jesus Christ, I need to spill that beer over. Um, which is general ambition and hustle you know that kind of dissecting my mindset and kind of understanding what works best for me and how i respond best with things like um i realized quickly that i work well working out wise in the morning i work well creatively at night like you know i've got my little things i start to realize you little hot spots that you can work with and you can kind of really hone in and do your best work but i've also tried to break down and understand what my motivations are you know what i mean what's driving me what's making me a fierce warrior all right what's driving me what's driving me and what is driving me, uh, like, it's bad to say it because I, I don't think I'm a hateful person. I don't really have a hateful burn in my body for the most part. The only thing I hate, um, I would say, with a passion, is probably raisins and magic. Yeah, I think that's it. Raisins, no, raisins, magic, and um, self-appointed, like, hall monitors. You know, like, uh, people that... I've said I mentioned it before, like people who take take it on take it on themselves to be the the building reg, uh, building relations manager for a flat they live in, right? Like adult do gooders, right? I don't have no time for adult do gooders. Hate raisins and I hate magic, like all those things. Go fuck yourself. Or oh, actually, you know what? See that ledge over there? Walk over it, lean over, and fall. Like no, no, no. Um, don't have any interest of it in my life whatsoever. But, but. It's interesting that the one thing that drives me, I've noticed over the years, right? Analyzing my motivations and things that make me go, right? Is revenge. Vengeance, right? Getting back at people who um, said no or getting back at people who assumed that I wouldn't get this or that. It's one of the most, it's one of the biggest driving forces in my life. Like that kind of like, you know, that kind of archetypal story of going back to the hood in a Lambo. You know what I mean? It's not the best idea because going to go back to the hood in Lambo, you probably you might you might die. You know what I mean? It's not the best idea. Antagonize even people that you live in that live in much harder conditions than you do. But that whole idea behind you know like sticking it back to your bullies. I've never been bullied in my life for the most part. I don't think I have. Have I? You know, if you don't remember you've been bullied, you've probably been bullied, isn't it? It's probably one of those like painful memories that you've kind of like erased from your brain doing a whole big hard reset. But I don't think I've been bullied. I don't think so. Maybe I have. Who knows? But anyway. What I do, because again, this hay fever, I don't want to take any tablets, man. So I apologize for me if, I'm, if I sound a bit like muggy on that microphone, but I don't want to take tablets because it makes me drowsy and I waste a complete day. You know what I mean? I want to do stuff today. So apologies for it. I know it's annoying um, hearing somebody uh, breathing, mouth breathing for the most part, but you know, let's, let's uh, cut me some slack here. So um, vengeance is my main driving force. And I've been thinking about it for a while and I stumbled upon this, I stumbled upon this clip, right? Or I was listening to Henry Rollins on uh, Joe Rogan podcast and then recently uh, Gary Vaynerchuk uh, podcast pod sessions that he does with three other guests. He had these, um, he had two NASCAR racers on and a lady that does the, I think the announcements or the interviews for WWE. So they're all kind of talking about that main driving force. And I went to play this clip and then kind of expound a little bit on what they're speaking about, right? See if I can get it up here. Hopefully you guys can see this. Come on, load. You want to shove it in everybody's face? Uh -huh. Clinic, that. <laughs> like the I told you so is the most fucking delicious flavor yeah. ever. Mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with it. Yeah. Do you feel that now? Like you've like clearly you're on a pretty big stage now. Yeah. You've been talking shit your whole life with your friends that like I'm gonna be on TV. Yeah. Like clearly some of them like smiled in your face but didn't think so. Do you love coming back to Indy and being like fuck you motherfucker? You know what? I, I 
I personally don't because I That's always. Just not your style. I, well, I mean, I always knew that I was going to be successful. Right. I mean, I, I. And you didn't give a fuck what Karen said. No, I didn't care about Karen. Fuck right. Karen. You hate Karen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I always knew I was going to be successful, whether you know whatever path. Why? I, took. I just, I don't accept failure. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, when I say I'm Type A, it's, it's a beautiful thing because it, it makes it so that I will never accept failure as even a remote possibility. How do you make, what's, what's the fine line between determination and delusion? Now, um, I've, hopefully you guys have heard that. It's a little clip from Pod Sessions on, by Gary V. You can find that on, I think, um, on, on iTunes. It's also available on his, on his um, YouTube channel. But those are two kind of um, really conflicting ideas in my head, right, about motivation, especially my motivation, right? Number one is driven by vengeance, right? I want to fucking stick that middle finger up at anyone that said no, anyone that overlooked me, anyone that dismissed me, all this sort of shit, right? There's, there's that driving force that's kind of like, you know, I'm going to go get it. But the other part of it is that I don't really care about what people have said or if they rejected me or anything, right? Because I've always had this really uh, bad... It's gonna, and it's going to relate later on to this interview with High Beast Radio with Bobby Hundred, so I'll keep this point in me. But I've always had a very... Uh, I've always had... Um, I've always had delusions of grandeur, right? I've always thought... I've always thought I was better than what I was, right? Regardless. And I knew I wasn't shit at the time, but I always still thought I was the fucking shit, right? And that kind of self-confidence can be great sometimes because it can push you through difficult ob difficult obstacles. It can get you in places that you're not meant to be in, right? I mean, it, it, and it can maybe impress the right people who have the kind of the same kind of type A, as that lady mentioned, winner mentality. But sometimes as well, it can sometimes skirt on the edge of delusion, right? And that's sometimes the thing that I kind of suffer from a little bit um, while I kind of contemplate a lot on, right? How do you spot when you're being delusional? Because sometimes in this kind of like free ranging career that I'm kind of picking, right? This kind of like creative living your life, like kind of like um, um, monetizing your lifestyle, kind of life that I'm living, right? When it comes to writing, going out, doing a podcast, DJing, uh, maybe making some merch. I watch, I'm actually going to show you some things later. Um, these things are like, they're, they're not really, they're not really a set career. They're not really a goal, a career that you can kind of find on LinkedIn, right? For the most part, everything I've described. They're sort of like slash, 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 slash things, right? Like this guy does, you know, something slash, something slash, slash, some, something slash. And those kind of jobs require you to just kind of like throw shit at the wall and see what sticks. But sometimes, because there's no uh, person picking, really, not, not really a person picking, but because there's not, there's not really a person picking or people picking, it's all kind of like subjective taste or whatever, there's no real, there's no real um, opportunity for you to realize when you're going down the right path or the wrong path. You can just continue and you just think it's going to work out. Like my DJing thing could be a good example, right? I could just continue making mixes online and post them and getting loads of listens online, right? And not playing anywhere and think I'm a, I'm a success, right? But then sometimes is that a bit delusional because it's like you haven't taken it the next step. No one is willing to pay you, right, to DJ anywhere. So that's maybe a bit of a, de a delusional thing. But then on the other side of it, I think sometimes that delusion is good because it keeps driving you. Because I'm not, I'm not delusional and dumb, right? I'm not, I'm not delusional to like quit a job without no backup plan, without any savings, without any money coming in, and just kind of pursue my passions. I think that's where the delusion comes in. The kind of people that go on X Factor and kind of re or the kind of people that go on on Shark Tank or Apprentice or, or Dragons Den, remortgage their house, sell, um, w uh, spend all their savings on an invention that clearly no one wants, right? Or an invention that maybe some people want. That, that they they went all chips in on something, and they haven't really even uh, thought about uh, whether or not it's going to fail or not. Or they haven't even they haven't even contemplated diversifying their portfolio of ideas. Right? They just kind of all pin all their hopes on uh, winning X Factor, winning American Idol, winning uh, and um, winning funding on Dragons Den or Shark Tank. I'm not that delusional. So I think that's where I kind of differ in that regard. Like I'm still going to make sure that I have money coming in. I'm still going to make sure that I have a regular source of income and then I'm going to pursue these things on the side and hopefully something will pop off and I can just go sayonara to the kind of nine to five. But it is a, it is a thing that I contemplate in my brain a lot. Like that thing, that idea of like, I'm, I'm driven by revenge, right? So all you motherfuckers watching or listening who said no, who kind of counted me out, who thought I wasn't going to get anywhere, just watch. Eventually, because I'm not, because again, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm in the long run right i don't care about making it now right I, I'm, I'm in for the long run game i want to be living a lifestyle where i'm able to monetize what i do and live a cool lifestyle into my 60s right I, so i've got all the time in the world i don't mind i don't care i know i'm going to be legendary so i don't mind eating shit right for now i don't mind like you know just eating shit and talking to no one it's no it's no problem whatsoever 
But sometimes as well, I'm also contemplating the idea is that I don't really care about what anyone says, right? Because I'm just dri- I'm just driven by just doing shit myself, right? I just want to, like, uh, I think I I listened earlier on to a podcast called Tall Tales, um, which featured uh, this guy called Chris Black on there. And they were talking about it. And it was like, um, they were kind of saying, oh, how they could never understand someone who just like has a nine to five and just goes and watches Netflix, right? Like, I can understand it because not everyone's going to be it because that's a bit patronizing. Not everyone is kind of like super creative and into like cool shit. I understand people can just go home and want to tap out. That's why people watch reality TV for the most part, right? Because it's just like brainless television, right? You don't need to engage anything in your head. You can just com- you can completely tap out and just can just watch just car crash television on your TV and kind of like have a bit of moral superiority and point at people and be like, oh, I can never do that, blah, blah, blah. So I see how people enjoy doing that sort of thing. But for me, for me... Uh, the main thing is I just want to use the time that I have available. And sometimes I think as well, I have a different opinion on those kind of things. I'm really thankful that I have a nine to five, really thankful that I've been able to kind of support myself and have jobs in between stuff that I'm doing. Because as as annoying as they've been, as time restrictive as they've been, as um, as frustrating as it is to have to listen to someone tell you what to do, ask permission to go on holiday and shit, it's like soul destroying. But what it, do, what it, what it does that a lot of people don't really uh, take a lot of people don't really um a lot of people take for granted is that it gives you structure right so if you're someone that is creative if you're someone that uh, do what that is doing things on the side it really makes you disciplined and that's something that a lot of creatives lack right a lot of creatives lack a business mindset right knowing how to organize your finances negotiating pay all that sort of shit uh, travel itinerary administration tasks like all that sort of stuff sometimes you're in marketing a lot of creators are really crap at that sort of thing but what they're good at is creating the actual art right whatever it may be writing books uh, magazines photos music i don't care whatever it is we're good at that sort of shit right but the other thing a lot of creators lack a, a lot a lot in which i'm i'm sure you've met them and i'm sure some people would kind of identify with this is discipline right is sitting down and actually doing the work, right? You might identify as a photographer, but how much time in the week, in the day, are you spending actually taking pictures, getting them developed, uh, thinking of new ways to showcase them online, making collages on Instagram, uh, cutting and pasting things together on Photoshop, messing around with Illustrator, making a zine. How much time are you spending actually doing those things, opening a Shopify account, uh, running ads on Facebook and Instagram, people can buy it. A lot of people don't do it. So they talk a big game, right? They say they're doing this, they do that, but the discipline of like spending two hours a day or four hours a day or five hours a day from the from six, seven a.m. from seven p.m. when you come back after work until one, are you spending the time on your craft? And if you're not, then unfortunately you're not gonna get far. It's just one of those kind of things. And I think work really speeds up that process and helps you kind of get that discipline involved. So then when you do finally make the jump to kind of like fly the nest and kind of go into it freelance, uh, you don't need you don't need any, you don't need someone to tell you what to do or when to do it. You don't need a calendar. You don't need all that sort of thing. You can kind of like structure your time yourself because you're so used to uh, utilizing your time very, you know, kind of, you're so used to kind of squeezing as much time as you can out of a short window. And I've noticed it myself. Like the, the things that I'm doing now, I don't think I ever did it like a couple of years ago. Do you know what I mean? Like, especially at this level of consistency, like every week I'm doing something. Do you know what I mean? I'm putting out something. It might not be a blog every day. It might be a three, four, five. I'm doing something. It might be a podcast every, every it might not be free a week, but it might be one. Do you know what I mean? It might not be DJing uh, once a week, but it might be two, two times a month. Like I'm doing something consistently, which has been very, very handy. And also it keeps a little nugget clear. I'm not as, um, I'm not as bitter as I was before. I wouldn't say, not, bitter's not even the right word, disgruntled. I'm not as disgruntled as I was previously. So that's kind of the friction that's in my head. Like, what is it? Is it hate? Is it, is it, is it yourself, drive yourself? I don't know what it is. I don't know, but I think the hate plays a lot into it. And people don't want to admit it, man. We, so we, we humans out here, we love to, we love to have a, we love to have a chip on our shoulder. And I kind of like the story of everyone, you know, the story of like someone uh, trying to sell a book proposal and get rejected by every single agent in the land and then get accepted by the one and it, it becoming like a New York Times bestseller. Oh my God, I got hair in my mouth. I bloody love that story. Like that's my MO. I would love that story. Do you know what I mean? Like getting a list of all the emails I've sent to people about doing stuff like getting involved in this, getting involved in that, and then it just being sent into like feeling like it's been sent into outer space, right? With no reply. I'd love to like get a list of all the people and make a list, you know what I mean? And then kind of like shit on them on my way back up. But I don't I don't necessarily care. I don't I don't even know where I'll start to even find those emails. And I'm not that bothered, you know what I mean? So it's a weird conflict, right? I'm driven by revenge, but I don't really give a shit, really, because I get it. I mean, no hard feelings. People are busy, some people don't want it, want you to do stuff with them. Like, I understand, but Maybe think about that. Take that as a little takeaway. What drives you, huh? What gets you out of bed? 
Let me know. Let me know. Uh, next on the schedule, remembering Harry. Well, this is a bit of a sad story, a bit of a bummer. So excuse uh, me damping the mood somewhat. But I'm sure as I'm, I think I mentioned it uh, last time uh, in, a, in a previous podcast. But unfortunately, this like harrowing, like really pointless death happened a few weeks ago um with um oh few maybe a couple of months ago involving a very well-known um black model by the name of harry ozoku and um, he was unfortunately murdered uh, in his area around shepherd's bush um some months ago by another rival model which sounds as ridiculous as it sounds um he got involved in some sort of like um in social media beef with the person involving a girl and then involving egos it finally kind of like ramped up to a point where they, they were bound to kind of cross paths. They met each other at Westfield to come and fight. Unfortunately, Harry went um, ill-equipped and carried a couple of dumbbells and one friend. And the other kid came there with two friends and um, each, each of them had a knife. And unfortunately, Harry couldn't um, put up much of a fight. One of the guys stabbed him through the, through the chest and he uh, managed to kind of crawl away, jumped in his car and drove back home. But then he collapsed on his pavement just outside of his house, which is... I mean, so, so sad. And you end up dying on the spot. But um, I guess some sort of justice has been served because the guys have been convicted of his murder recently. I've seen, but they've made a really nice feature about him on the BBC called Remembering Harry, which I'm going to pop up on the site, on the screen now. You guys can check. I'll put it in the show notes for everyone listening on the audio podcast. But yeah, it's a completely, really sad story, man. It goes to show, like, how just this generation, man, like, you know, or just not just just these, in these times, like, how... Um, you know, life is just being like wasted and fleeted away. Do you know what I mean? Like such potential is being fleeted away over kind of really rudimentary, really stupid reasons. Do you know what I mean? Like they were beefing over a girl that none of them, both of them were, weren't really romantically involved in, weren't seriously romantically involved in, but kind of like both dated for a bit. And it's just really, really sad. Um, so I read a little bit of it on the on the site. Uh, it's on BBC News feature. It kind of says on the following harry was one of the first people stabbed in the death in, in uk in 2018 he was just 25 a fashion model with everything to live for which is uh, annoying which is really sad because most of the deaths that we've seen in the uk involving knife crime have unfortunately um have or fortunately unfortunately have involved gang members right so it's been kind of gang warfare there's been some some innocent people caught, caught in the crossfire but we haven't necessarily seen two kids who are not involved in gangs right um duking it out and involving knives i mean it's not necessarily a thing that happens he was just 25 a fashion model everything to live for uh fellow model george co has been convicted of his of his murder along with a man uh the third has convicted of manslaughter so those those ones happen this is really sad man like i mentioned previously um harry was one like the harry was one of the first sort of like urban fashion models or black fashion models that i kind of like paid attention to back in the day when i used to read fashion magazines and shit he was the first kind of one that actually he was the first one that blew because he was like from the end he was like yeah you know I mean? he was he was he was he was a like he wasn't just some kid from like i don't know the stick somewhere who happened to be black right he was like an actual black kid um from the hood and that kind of spurned a whole new wave of models that kind of came through and i saw some pictures of the trial which i'm not going to bring up again or that was on the daily mail when i read it and he saw a lot of the kind of like supporting cast that industry kind of coming um to court and to kind of i don't know give evidence whatever it may be and it was just sad to see all these kind of kids who I kind of followed on on magazines and shit, appearing at court, appearing appearing in court because one of their friends had been murdered by a fellow model. It's just such a waste of life, man. Um. Anyway, um. The article continues. Harry was a successful model. Uh, a, a hard a hard line of work to stain. Yeah, fashion for faces. Duh, duh, but Harry had lasted the best part of a decade. He had been booked for jobs that black male models had struggled to get in the past. At 25, he know he knew he had a good run and made a good living, but he was starting to explore the idea of doing something else, writing a film, launching a magazine that would celebrate black excellence. Life was good. His girlfriend, Ruby Campbell, was also a model. They had flown to St. Lucia for Christmas, the first truly big holiday he ever had. He was building a house for his mother, Josephine, in her home country, Nigeria, where she planned to return. But on Thursday, 11th of January, all this ended. Harry lay on the pavement, his body punctured with knife wounds. One was, one was to the heart. The paramedics and doctors couldn't save him. At five o'clock, on the cold concrete outside his home in Shepherd's Bush in West London, he was declared dead. A confrontation with another male model lasting just a couple of minutes had taken everything. Like it's harrowing how quickly, isn't it? Well, life, life can your life can get. You know what I mean? It can take away from you. You know what I mean? One moment he's at home, like beefing with this guy across on social media, and the next he's like strewn on the floor, covered in blood. Do you know what I mean? Um, but the article itself is really it's a really good feature. It kind of features everything about where he grew up. Um, that grew up in Dagenham Heathway. He kind of talks about his ex-girlfriend, Leomi, uh, Jerome, 
or Jeremy from the ends as well, who kind of like gives a little, um, eulogizes him a little bit. And I think um, this might be a good place to kind of start in terms of talking. Let me just read uh, Jeremy's bit here. Uh, when I was growing up, there didn't seem to be many black male models um, around. So just seeing Harry's face in London's West End on a big advertising board at Oxford Circus would be enough to stir up a sense of pride. There was just something about him. Inspiration was a word that's been used time and time again to describe him by stylists, agents, photographers, and other models. He was fun. whose personality was eager to learn, eager to be around, according to his friends. Kevin Morosky, a photographer and filmmaker, shot Harry in one of his first editorials. Harry became the go-to guy. He says he had a massive impact on the way the fashion industry cast dark-skinned boys, but there were challenges. With his friends Jeremy Boating and Chuck Ache, Harry helped start a collective of young black models with the aim of supporting each other and getting ahead. It was all made up of black boys, black models. In the industry, we were sort of black blocked. Those in the, those in the group uh, felt they only got put on put up for certain jobs. Right now, for black models in the industry, there are very things are very different. But at that time, no one was doing. Uh, like the Pradas, we were doing like the JD Sports and River Islands, no high end ones. It was really, which I, I don't, which I, which is a good point. I, I remember that era actually. They were mostly footlocker, like, uh, JD Sports, McKenzie and stuff. Do you know I mean, they weren't really doing high end modeling. So you have to kind of thank a lot of those models for doing that. And also a lot of the d designers who were kind of um, allowing a more diverse uh, runway. You know, it's kind of represent their, their brand overall. Um, it wasn't really common to see black a lot of black models doing that, especially boys. It writes Harry, known as H to his friends, uh, radiated affection of positive energy. You change a lot of those really young mindsets that feel a lot of black people have, um, where it's like you can't show love to your bro. Says Jeremy, he was always that inc that encouragement, like you can do anything. He used to come to me and be like, Jay, you can do it. I know you can do it. You really, you really, you you don't really get that among young black brothers. A lot of it is just competition, which is very, very true. Um, again, man, it's super sad. I don't want to dwell on this too much because it's kind of bumming me out. Um, you know, he's such a talented kid. Um, has so much ahead of him, and I don't know, man. For someone not involved in kind of gang culture to kind of lose his life in that way, it's just really, really sad. And I don't know if any sort of lessons are going to be learned from it. But if you read the story, the whole case behind it, it does go to prove that he did have good people around him because throughout the whole time he was beefing with his kid on, on the Instagram, um, the people were telling him to just allow it, leave it, don't um, rise above it, don't stoop to his level, like putting him, kind of persuading him not to go and meet this guy or, or get involved in actual physical education. But he just couldn't help himself. Do you know what I mean, he, he couldn't, like his pride got the better of him. And he wanted to kind of like, I don't know, like put let, let the guy know that he needs to be respected. And unfortunately, it ended like this. And, you know, it could have ended like with both of them dying, really, effectively, if Harry took a knife with him, too. So it's not, do you know what I mean, it's not as if like not someone did worse than the other because they both went to meet each other. Harry did carry a dumbbell in his hand. He didn't carry a dumbbell to go do dumbbell curls. You know what I mean, he did go to inflict some damage. So I guess it's just just sad overall, man. I just wish, you know what I mean, like it's just crabs in a barrel mentality, really, like for two black models in a fairly niche industry and they have a fairly niche look right being black and looking a certain way you know you're only going to appeal to a certain number of brands you're only going to get a certain amount of sh uh, uh shows or shoots in general anyway do you know what i mean it's, it's, it is a competitive industry by its very nature i think the last thing you need to be doing is competing with your fellow people do you know what i mean people that are actually going to be at each casting with you it must get really awkward do you know what i mean especially beefing with people that are going to be going up for the same jobs as you every single week um, you wish there was a bit more of a camaraderie around it, even if it's not fake camaraderie where you had to pretend to be friends, but just like a a professional, a bit of professional respect. Do you know what I mean where we can kind of? Because that's a thing that I'm a big fan of. I think more so than the kind of like fake. Oh, let's be friends, kumbaya, DJ Khaled shit. Like let's just get get on without without ripping each other's hair out. I think that's kind of a good way to kind of go about things. But again, I'll, I'll link the feature in the show notes. Uh, remembering Harry and Zoko, um, RIP, man, you will be missed and thoughts and prayers as always go out to his family uh next on the list tip to your uber eats driver now this is a bit of a funny story i saw this pop up on the bbc website and it says the following uh, uber eats cyclist was pictured pedaling on the m20 m5 m5 in oldbury it's fucking nuts right seeing this duh, duh, duh. let me show it now on the screen if you guys see it can you see that look at this guy he's pedaling on the motorway i'm not sure what the what the rules are is it legal to, to cycle on a motorway I don't know, but it says the following: a uh, uh, cyclist carrying an Uber Eats backpack has been pictured pedaling along the motorway in West Midlands. Watch commander at Oldbury Fire Adam Joyce tweeted the image, urging the company to educate riders so uh, his team aren't f lifting a HGV off them. <laughs> Mr. Joyce said that the man was cycling on the N35 near Junction Two on Tuesday morning. Uber said it was investigating; it had safety concerns, uh, and the safety and the safety of the customers and couriers of the general public is top priority. In response to Mr. Joyce's tweets, one user said, "Wow." no words another echoed the thing da, 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 da. so it's just nuts isn't it like imagine that. 
<laughs> I'm not sure if you actually heard. Is it illegal to ride? Um, let me Google that. Is it illegal? Uh, is it illegal to cycle uh, on motorway? On the motorway. Is it actually illegal? I think it should be, right? However, some motorway organizations have all expressed concerns. Cyclists and horses riders don't pay to count road tax and shouldn't be allowed... Oh, so it's not illegal to ride on a mo- to ride on a, on a, um on a motorway. Okay, I get it now. Cause okay, makes sense. Um, just on a hard shoulder, which is still weird. But anyway, I get it. But yeah, it goes. I, I was just pointing at that Uber Eats thing. You know, like I see these Uber Eats. I use Uber Eats as much as anyone else does, right? Um, I I'm a fucking sucker, sucker, right? For a good old McDonald's Uber Eats after I've DJed somewhere, after I've gone out. I mean, especially since my, I've got a couple uh, McDonald's around me that are 24 hours, like the one in Forest Gate, I've got the one in Stratford that's open until two, so I've got loads of options to go to, right? So I'm a fan of having an Uber as much as anyone, but sometimes when these guys come to your house and they look super tired or they're covered in fucking rain because they've been outside on their bike all day, man, it's super sad. So for the most part, what I try and do sometimes, I do try and have a bit of change left in my house, like a little pot that I tip my Domino's delivery people with, Deliveroo sometimes, but I don't use them because their delivery charges are fucking through the roof, fuck Deliveroo. Um, and then sometimes as well, my Uber Eats driver. So I highly recommend it, man. Like tip your the Uber Eats drivers. Like give them a couple quid. Do you know what I mean? Like make their make their day, put a smile on their face. Just like a little thing. Do you know what I mean? Like thank you so much. And I kind of make an effort to kind of look them in the eye like, hey, uh, thanks a lot, man. This is for you. Do you know what I mean? Like a couple quid. It's not nothing. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, it can buy the guy a couple of cup of coffee. It can go to his cigarette fund or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like I think it's super important. But jesus christ man what kind of app is going to tell you to go through a motorway to go get the de- deliver it maybe it's just like a guy you know how you know how these t- hip, cycling hipsters uh carry around like raw male satchels and shit right um because they're really comfy to wear and they've got loads of compartments or whatever there's some there's some sort of functionality towards it but you know it's a little bit you know it's a bit it's a bit annoying but maybe it just might be one of those things maybe someone's just bought it from ebay because i do remember I do remember seeing someone selling a delivery kit, like the whole delivery kit, like the backpack, the jacket, the polo, like the whole thing. They were selling it online. It looked pretty fly. I'm not gonna be. I'm not gonna lie, man. The jacket's got some 3M on it. The backpack is insulated and shit. Do you know what I mean? It's, it looks pretty cool. But yeah, Jesus Christ, Uber, man, get your riders in check. But then it might go back to again. I've mentioned that interview. I mentioned in the last podcast. Check it out on episode 94. I mentioned there was an interview. Uh, with Recode, Recode did an interview with um with the kind of like the head guy at Uber Eats, right? And I I kind of got the assumption, which I kind of well, the, the idea that maybe maybe Uber might go into a lane, which they might well, again. I'm not sure how it's going to work with health and safety standards, where they could somehow empower people who are like uh, home um kind of urban kitchen people. You know the guys that kind of like set up uh urban restaurants, sorry, that set up a restaurant inside their own home. So they might have like a set menu for the weekend, right? So they'll have like people come in during the weekend and you can pay a, a nominal fee or usually it's like a donations because to avoid any sort of taxes, I'm assuming. And then you can kind of like have this kind of urban kitchen feel. And a lot of people have kind of taken that a step further and there's that trap kitchen, not the US one, but the, the U, not the US one, the UK one, where they do everything through Instagram and Snapchat. They have like a menu, a short menu, a kind of like a little menu they'll pop on Instagram uh, for a specific time or specific day maybe like a on a weekend or whatever and you call the number and you order some food and then when it's run out they'll post it on they'll post on instagram when it's sold out and then effectively you order the food and you go collect it at the designated spot they'll kind of tell you where, the, where they're based location wise you go pick it up and a lot of people have, have been doing this um this kind of thing but i'm sure you know people i love ordering things at home like you know what i mean like um I've, I've heard the debate about the last mile like um um the last mile meaning um who's going to be the first which 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 would be the what company would be the first to kind of like um guarantee one hour deliveries right so you order you order like a usb cable from amazon because you've lost yours and it gets to where you are within the hour right? instead of like you know some you get some you get sometimes you get some items you can you can order from amazon prime uh kind of like same day delivery right but they have like a short um a really small selection of stuff and usually it's based primarily on where you're located in the in london or in wherever you are in the world and they might have a hub next to you that has a certain range of products, whatever, blah, 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 blah. So it'll be interesting to see if where they go next. Like, will they be able to somehow empower people who are cooking at home and offer them a service where they can kind of set up an e- a kind of like digital restaurant lives only on the app, right? Because he mentioned it before, the head guy at Uber Eats, that some people are saving, are like pulling resources uh, together, saving up some money, and then hiring a kitchen for six months, and then just cooking out of that every, every, like four days a week, right? 
and then kind of like as a cash grab and just running it all through Uber Eats, and just not having a not actually having a physical restaurant itself, just kind of running the the entire thing through the app. So maybe the same same sort of thing could happen um, on with uh, individual kind of like cooks and shit, right? You can kind of run it all through here because I've kind of had the idea for a while. I've been kind of kind of slowly poking the brunette because she's an amazing cook to kind of get her, pull her finger out of her ass and kind of offer up her kind of pastries and little uh, meals and shit all, um, all available online so you can kind of collect it. But it's good. Like I said, delivery is the way to go. Um, if they can somehow implement that, that would be amazing. Because that might be how Postmates works, right? Can Postmates pick up something from someone's house? It can, right? I'm assuming, right? You can pick up from anywhere. That's kind of the whole benefit of it. You just kind of stand, tell someone what you want and they'll go pick it up for you. So maybe that would be a good thing to work. But yeah, Uber Eats, man, look after your drivers. Uh, don't make them go in the motorway. And if you Uber Eats guys come to your house and you... Just, don't don't tip the Uber East persons, right? If you live in a flat, don't tip the Uber East guy who buzzes at your door and says, oh, um, I can't come up. Come collect it downstairs. Because those guys are cunts, right? Because my address on my Uber doesn't change, right? I've had the same address on my Uber since whenever I've been using the app. So it clearly says you've got to buzz the door. It clearly says what number I'm at. But some guys will be like, oh, I didn't see it on the app. You've got to come down. And, and, they, and, they, don't, and they never come up. They actually fought, fight and argue with you, which is super annoying. So those guys don't tip. But the guys that, you know, come really quick and they're... Um, I don't know, just, you know, they're pleasant to deal with. Tip them. Tip your Uber drivers. Next on the docket list. What have, what have we got here as well? Uh, oh, uh, Bobby Hundreds and Ben Hundreds on the business of hype. Yep, let me go get something now because I don't think I've got it checked off my website. But I listened to it the other day. Um, business of hype. Business of hype. Hundreds. So I heard this the other day, a business of hyper interview with a uh, presented by Jeff Staple, which I'm, I'm sure everyone here should be aware of or knows who that person is. But it was a really good interview that I listened to um, with these guys. Right. Um, so on a business of hype, you can check it out on Instagram on most places. I'll link it below. Anyway, you know where to find these kind of places where podcasts live and on website. I think they've got SoundCloud and all that malarkey. But it's a really, really fucking good interview. Right. Like it's insanely good. It's a. Uh, Really good um, visit back to memory lane. I'll kind of just get it up quickly here on screen so you guys can see. So it basically reads as follows. The Business of Hype is a weekly series brought to you by Hype Beast Radio, presented by Jeff Staple. For episode 16, Bobby Hundreds and Ben Hundreds of the Hundreds, uh, drive into the brand's, uh, dive into the brand's origin story. One of, uh, one many, one many revere as the first streetwear brand born on the internet. A self-described two-part project that houses a classical, a classic Californian streetwear brand and a media platform dedicated to global street culture. The Hundreds has served as a blueprint of success for much of its of this new global generation of urban youth minded brands. While the early days of the Hundreds are fairly well documented, often uh, from the perspective of its own um, innate, oh, what's that? Inanimate self, we seldom hear the full story. Let me stop show. My, my my reading aloud is so so shit. I'm sorry. Uh, hear the full stuff about Hundred and Ben starting starting all the way back before they befriended one another in law school. As a result, we learn much more about intricacies of partnership. One that finds a red band between the creative guy and the business guy, which is kind of the big takeaway of this kind of interview, right? Um, knowing your role, knowing your place, right? There's a lot of that in the interview, and just kind of longevity. I kind of like it took me back to my um, my kind of origin stories starting up in the whole streetwear scene. You know, I kind of got my start interning for 12 Bar, which was a, a small London streetwear brand, uh, kind of like with a kind of a musical tilt, as you can guess by the name 12 Bar. Um, the founders were really cool. They kind of got me involved and I kind of did everything from like helping to design T-shirts to printing out invoices to packing and parceling to delivering stuff to shops. I did absolutely everything. Right. I was a go to intern and I just got paid like a uh, weekly travel card. Right. And they were a bit of a dicks with that travel card. They made that difficult. I didn't even ask for anything else. I didn't ask for food. I just asked for travel card money. And they were kind of difficult with that. But, you know, no hard feelings at the time. It happens to everyone, I guess, internships. But the real benefit of it is that these guys, because they were the first around uh, streetwear-wise, and they were kind of like pillars of the UK scene and London scene, Ben and Bobby Hundreds, or Ben or Bobby especially when he came to visit London, he used to visit one of the founders, Nick, of Tall Bar, every time they used to come to London. And he used to basically sleep on Nick's uh, couch for, for the most part. And I got to meet Bobby Hundreds a few times in the beginning, which was interesting because he was, you know, he just always was a really cool guy. I knew him. Um, 
I knew him. I knew him for the internet because I was a. I used to be big on the hype beast forums. I used to be one of the administrators and mods on there, or whatever. I used to have a bit of a mouth, as you can tell. I was quite opinionated and stuff, so I used to kind of share some DMs with Bill Bobby over the internet or what it may, or whatever it, it may be. But it was interesting because I think that was a time when I was kind of getting a bit miffed already, right, with the streetwear scene. Because you have to remember back then, right, you were kind of like you were kind of quote unquote competing or talking to um, adults, people like that were like I don't know, twenty six and up right and at that time i must have been like i don't know 16 to 18 years old and you're kind of like you know arguing with these guys who are kind of trolling online because you're wearing newer brands that they're not part of you know because they were still into stussy they're still wearing i don't know whatever brands they're wearing you're not wearing right so there was always that kind of like generational divide um and then as well on top of that um london in general is just a bit clicky so you, if you wasn't in the right group some people wouldn't give you a certain amount of they wouldn't give you a time of day and those are kind of like loads of kind of scene politics that I know isn't exclusive to the streetwear scene, but it was just annoying, you know, for someone, it was the first kind of subculture or scene that I was part of, right? Um, I kind of, I kind of was an admirer of skateboarding from the app from afar, but I didn't really get into it because I thought it was a little bit, you know, I just, I didn't really vibe with those guys too much, but I was, a, I was following everything on the internet for the most part. So I lived entirely on the internet, which I still do now. Hello, live on the internet. Um, so I still live on the internet now, but I remember there was a time when, you know, I was getting miffed by the streetwear scene because for the most part, whenever our kind of, our version of browsing the net or like hanging on Instagram was going to shops, right? And just looking on the rails and walking around, right? And just like visiting stores and hanging out and kind of drinking and just, you know, standing around looking cool. That was basically what the Insta what our Instagram was back in the day. And whenever you go into stores, you always get vibed out, especially when I used to go to the old streetwear stores where it was hideout, bape. BBC, wherever they were, right? All these stores, slamming kicks in the beginning. Now I'm cool with these people. But they were real dicks. On slamming kicks, no. Magdi was always safe, actually. I, I take that back. Slamming kicks, no. Magdi was always really good. But everyone else was a bit of a dick, right? Um, oh, and Foot Patrol. Uh, Ways and Foot Patrol was always safe to us as well in the beginning. But everyone else, apart from that, apart from those two shops, was an absolute dickhead, right? So they just treat you like shit. They'll vibe you out. And you just didn't feel welcomed. But the funny thing was, when Bobby came to visit Nick, uh, Bobby Hundred came to visit Nick that summer, and we visited the same stores, I'd get vibed out, and people wouldn't pay me any mind. It was so funny to see the change in attitudes, like how much they were licking my ass, like just bred in, and just, just, it was weird to see these grown men who are treating me like a, like shit on the bottom of their, sh like shit on the bottom of their shoe, right? Suddenly now turning tails and treating me like I was fucking, I don't know, the son of James Jebbio. Do you know what I mean? It was absolutely amazing to see. But it also confirmed to me that I mean that these guys were you know nothing but pieces of shit. You know what I mean? Just you know, just because you're old, I never. My, I, I was fortunate. My parents did talk, teach me that, especially when I was younger. That just because I think because um, even though I'm African and we have a, quite a big extended family, my parents are pretty cool at like, just keeping themselves to themselves. They don't really hang out with other families. We usually spend Christmas on our by ourselves. Like we don't really that all, all that shit, right? And I can remember from when I was young, my parents would always tell me. Um, don't just respect someone because of their age, right? I mean, like people have to earn respect. They don't, have to, you don't just get, you don't just become, you don't just um, get respect because you just happen to be a certain age, which is really uh, counter anything you might hear in, in kind of like an African household. For the most part, they'll just tell you respect your elders, right? Regardless of what they do, regardless of this guy's a woman beater, regardless of this guy's a fucking alcoholic, regardless of this guy beats his kids, they'll tell you just respect your elders. But my parents were never on that tip. So I guess it kind of carried over into the streetwear world, into kind of corporate job world, where it kind of did serve me well, but sometimes it did kind of hamper me because I always, cause sometimes I could be described as the kind of like angry guy in the corner or the guy that was rude or whatever, or standoffish. I can understand if people would say that. I don't necessarily think so, but I can get off something because I wasn't, I wasn't willing to like um, um, kind of like bow before people who just happen to have jobs, right? Who happen to be older and happen to be, you know, just not get fired for a certain period of time and just hang around long enough to kind of like work their way up the ranks, but weren't necessarily good at what they did. No, 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 um, no respect for all that whatsoever. And people that kind of wore their jobs as a kind of a person, a kind of an identity, you know, the kind of person that puts like um, Wyden and Kennedy in their kind of like in their username of, on Instagram or on Twitter. Like, I don't know, Bobby Wyden Kennedy. It's like, go fuck yourself, man. Do you know what I mean? It's not yours. Like, you're claiming, of, you're claiming like ownership on something that isn't yours. You just happen to be like a social media manager in this company. You're, you know what I mean, I don't get it. Anyways, this kind of interview made me go back to memory lane, but also made me appreciate how, how influential and how, how kind of um, overlooked 
Bobby Hundreds and Ben Hundreds are as businessmen within streetwear. They've been able to kind of like ride various waves, right? They've been able to survive um, various periods within streetwear. They've been able to survive various um, public, um, public, I won't say outcry, but maybe backlash from the kind of articles that Bobby's written. Because if, you, if you've known... Bobby's really opinionated when it comes to topics on streetwear. He's super passionate. He made a documentary as well about it. And um, I mentioned on the interview that he's, what he's writing his own memoir, which I'm sure is going to be really interesting to read. But he's always been very in very invested in the community and making sure it doesn't die. Um, the kind of like quote-unquote traditional streetwear, do you know what I mean? Like snapbacks, t-shirts, uh, denim and trainers. You know what I mean? He's like, he's of that world, that kind of like quote-unquote real streetwear. Not the streetwear that fucking fashionistas talk about, do you know what I mean? Which just means wearing trainers with your suit. Not that fucking shit, but like actual streetwear. And I'm I'm a real fan of Bobby. I'm a real fan of Ben. And I'm a real fan of their partnership too, because I think that was something that I kind of the last bit which they mentioned, which Jeff mentions in the in the in the kind of um, copy for this interview, where it says, um, "What's the quote say here? Yeah. As a result, we learn much more um, about the intricacies of a partnership, one that finds the rare balance between the creative guy and the business guy. And I have to be honest, right? This is something that I've kind of struggled a lot with in my life in general." The things well, I've only struggled it once, but you know, it kind of burned me. I'm not, I probably won't ever do it again. But when I was running, when I was doing club nights in Dawson and Shoreditch and stuff with a mate, and we were kind of running those for a few years and it was going really well, um, I, I, I felt, I'm sure he felt a lot of things, but I felt a lot of things as well. And I felt that sometimes the partnership or the relationship was kind of like it wasn't balanced, right? It was kind of like sometimes depending on what event it was depending on who was organizing it depending on who took the lead it was sometimes lopsided right sometimes if i was the one that sourced the club or got in got the in touch with the djs or organized the flight oh, then whatever it may be it just didn't feel balanced right and sometimes there wasn't any clear delineation between who was a creative and who was a business guy and sometimes if you are if you feel like you're in charge of designing flyers and you're getting last minute suggestions from the business guy or from the quote-unquote person who's booking the djs about who should what the flyer should look like you'll get annoyed if you're designing the flyers and you don't know what to do and in the last minute you're getting asked, oh, who do you think we should book for DJing? You're getting annoyed because you're like, I thought you already sorted that. Do you know what I mean? So there wasn't a clear delineation. And then just in terms of just the general workload, sometimes we'd be doing these nights and I'd be, I'd start early, right? So I'd go, because I'd, because I would, I'd be happy to like dress the room, kind of like put up posters and I don't know, put up a t-shirt. I don't know, just do my shit. You know what I mean? Just kind of like make the space a bit fun. Because um, I was happy to dress the room, kind of for lack of a better phrase. When, um, when my, so I, I'd start early. I'd start the set, like do the kind of like quote-unquote graveyard shift. So I'd start like from like eight or nine. And if you know anything about Dawson, if you know anything about, it might have changed, I don't know, because I haven't been out there in ages, but I remember back in the day, like no one would be out in Dawson before 10 o'clock. Like no one. Maybe it might have changed now because of the uh, the new hackney licensing laws or in general because a new generation of kids coming through are a lot more excited. But back in the day, no one's going to be out in Dawson before 10. So I'd be doing a graveyard shift from like 8 to 11 DJing and then my partner would come and kind of jump on the desk afterwards. And I just, you just do, a bit of resentment will build up just because, you know what I mean? Like you're designing the flyers, you're getting them printed, you're post, again, we probably uh, split the cost on the printing cost but just you know just the kind of like the annoyingness of having to go to the printer get them printed make sure they're correct dragging them all over the place carrying tape putting them up uh djing for four hours before anyone before anyone arrives in an empty room and then jumping off and letting your partner kind of quote unquote get all the glory and the attention for people because people can actually see that he's djing where people didn't know that i was djing because you didn't know because you weren't there early enough and then you had to split the money 50 50 and it kind of rubbed me up the wrong way and then eventually it got to a point where that kind of relationship, you know, it kind of disintegrated for varying reasons. And it kind of, you know, now I'm kind of doing my own thing. I kind of work with people sometimes, you know, I kind of do this thing at Tap East um, for a night called Tap. Check it out. I'm DJing on Friday and I do something at Heathcote and Star uh, la called La, la Betise, which is another night that I put on. But usually I kind of do that on my own or I invite DJs to play along with me. But I don't do them, I don't do it as a partnership anymore. And that was specific, that was probably the reason why. Now, again, if I'm probably even burnt by it. It's probably holding me back. Probably should get a partner to kind of divvy up the cost and to kind of do something really big. But, man, like, that conversation needs to be had in the beginning. And I'm so glad to hear Bobby Hunter just talk about it. And I mean, that delineation between, like, you no, know, Bobby actually... I think Jeff Staple asked him something along the lines of like, if you, I mean, you, you know how much money you're making. You know that most of your stuff is coming from... Most of the kind of money is maybe coming from the the ideas are in his head and he's sketching them down. Is there a temptation to just like cut the other guy out and just take all the money yourself? He's like, nah, of course not, because Ben brings a lot to the table. Like that business acumen, that ability to like deal with um, accounts and sales, um, 
stockists and all that sort just the actual bread and butter of running a business is super important and to and to be in a position where he can just lock the door and just draw right and kind of not worry about the business because he knows he's got he's got it he's got it's in safe hands with he's going one of his best friends is kind of running that side i think that's something that's like really overlooked and something that a lot of creatives don't really uh pay a lot more attention to and i think people should do especially nowadays I think it's really, really important to do, especially since everyone's kind of got access to these kind of people and sees what they're doing and everyone's kind of inspired by the same people want to do the same things. It could be tempted to kind of band together and, and do something, but then no one's really delineated the roles and said, who's doing what? Like, not even a kind of like, you got a role and you can't do something else, but a rough idea of what you what you think you're going to bring to the table. What what are your best, what are your skills and what can, what's going to be of best use to the group kind of thing? And then kind of be allowing that person to kind of do their best work. And then you can kind of take a step back. I think that's really important. It's something that I've kind of didn't really do well in my overall career, especially in the nightlife career. I'm kind of happy I do it on my own now, to be honest, in general, because, you know, I'm kind of building up my own profile and it just makes it a bit easier and stuff. But, you know, there needs to be that kind of acknowledgement of like, okay, I'm doing the artwork. You do this, you do that. Do you know what I mean? There needs to be something that needs to be going on there in that regard. And I think this interview is probably one of the best ones I've listened to in terms of, kind of understanding the whole history of streetwear and he touched upon something which is really interesting too um the whole idea behind um um talking about scotty um scotty hundreds and um, the guy that used to do all the sales for the hundreds who's kind of like uh, kind of the other quote-unquote face if you remember he was a guy with a kind of crazy curly hair um he was kind of like started off as an intern and kind of worked his way up until he kind of got to the one of the highest paid people in the, in the company so a real a real kind of like um the archetypal like you know if you work hard enough you can get to a top kind of story in streetwear and um he mentioned something along the lines of like yeah he was like offhandedly bobby said something like oh he he knew too much you know what i mean and i think that was kind of one of my achilles heels coming up in the scene the idea that i had all the knowledge but none of the actual practitioner skills sets so i mean i hadn't done anything i had it all up here theoretically i knew everything i knew photographers i knew magazines i knew lookbooks I knew collections, I knew people who were behind the brands. Um, I had um, had kind of like a philosophical aspect of my life that I was kind of kind of pursuing because I was, got, I was getting into like startup culture. And I was getting into kind of like listening to motivational speakers and re reading nonfiction and reading all that sort of stuff. But I hadn't actually made anything, right? So I hadn't actually put all that shit into practice. And that can be so, dis so de debilitating that you probably don't even know, right? Because sometimes... There is, it's something that's been said a lot, Tim Serra says it a lot, there is a paralysis by analysis, like having so much information in your head, you're just frozen and you can't do anything, right? Because you've got all this stuff that you're trying to calculate in your brain, which isn't the best way to go about things. So if there's anything I could change, it'll be that, like probably knowing, I'd probably, I'd probably go for knowing 50% less and then just like trying shit out. Because the other 50 I can just learn on the, on the job. But just learning all this stuff by theory isn't the best way to go. But I'd imagine, I'd rec highly recommend checking out this interview. If you're into streetwear, if you want to start your own brand, um, if you just want to get involved in a scene and do something. I think that's one of the big takeaways too. I think Bobby always says it like, do you, would you, Jeff Staple asked him, would you encourage anyone to start a brand? He says, yeah, I always tell everyone to start a brand. Because it's less about the brand and more so about the idea of doing something, right? Because a brand like a restaurant encompasses all aspects like sales, marketing, branding, advertising, uh, business management, like incorporates all that shit, partnership, influence of marketing, incorporates all of it into a little t-shirt brand. You can do all of it, right? So that that kind of aspect of it is really important. It might kind of lead you into different avenues. You might end up being a sales manager or an account manager for a different brand. You might end up being an agent for somebody. You might go into different fields, but I think the idea of just like starting a brand is really important. I think everyone has it, right? I, I have like so many brands on my fucking laptop. Um, my kind of like Photoshop files that I haven't started yet and it's kind of that whole idea so it's something I'm definitely going to learn from it and because of that I'm actually going to go print some t-shirts actually this week um, after listening to that interview you know it's kind of like putting stuff into action because it's well you know it's important man listen to all these podcasts listen to these interviews they, they're really inspiring really motivational but that inspiration can only last a couple of days it's about putting the stuff into action so you listen to that sort of stuff and put it into action so I recommend you listen to this um, episode of Business of Hype featuring Bobby and Ben Hundreds it's really informative like loads of real good detail in it. It's really long as well, so you can kind of dig deep into it. And I mentioned before, I wasn't a fan of Jeff Staples narrating, n narrating, n narrating, narrating. But in this website, he writes really well. He does really, he does, he does narrating really well. Where he kind of sums up key points of the story and kind of like rounds them up in little little chunks that you can kind of take away. So if you're, if you, again, if you're not a fan of Jeff Staples, you kind of put off by him. I highly recommend you check it out. I think this is probably his best platform. Um, in terms of communicating ideas, sometimes when he's like standing in front of another pigeon dunk, I mean, it kind of comes across like, you know, 
it kind of comes across a little bit disingenuous. Do you know what I mean? Like he's taking us for a ride again, like again a pigeon dunk. I kind of get it. You know, he says like it's his um it's his quote unquote hero product, right? <laughs> Um, it's something that he's done really well and people there's a demand for it still so why wouldn't you cash out right I, I get it but i think this avenue this kind of like um entrepreneurial mentorship kind of like business side of him of, of his work i'm sure he's really good at i'm sure he consults for merit a various amounts of brands that we're not even probably aware of or he's probably got interested interest in certain brands i think this is where he his skill set really comes to life and you kind of get a lot of the you kind of get why jeff staple is still the people it's still someone that people go to now and now there's the industry yes he's a 20-year veteran in the scene but just again like i mentioned before just because you've been in the scene for long doesn't mean you know what you're talking about but jeff staple 100 percent knows what you're talking about he's got he's definitely this is a hundred percent the best best kind of like platform for it for you to absorb any just staple sort of content so i recommend you check it out uh business of hype interview with bobby and ben hundreds i'm going to link it in the show notes below anyway moving on next on the docket um asap bari sue sexual assault ass accuser oh my god all right so as i mentioned in my previous episode you might have checked out i've also put it up in the little clips i, I do actually i'm making clips so check them below when i'll i'll, I'll do, Click a link there. If you listen to this, watching this via YouTube, I'll make a link to my uh, playlist of clips. I do take some clips from my podcast. Sometimes they can be a bit long. You might not want to listen to the whole thing. So I'll take some clips on topics I've been speaking about, which you can kind of listen to, which will, you know, vary in, in lengths. Um, and I mentioned the other day um, that um, ASAP Bari, <coughs> the founder of Vlone, or Vlone, sorry, Vlone or Vlone, however, however you pronounce it, um, you know, part of the whole ASAP crew, um, he has obviously um as you know last year he was involved in a kind of sexual assault case with a girl when a video leaked of, of him kind of taking off the duvet on some girl who's in bed with another dude um that that case had been dropped in la right so i think he'd been charged in both places i'm not sure why maybe because he's a u.s citizen he was charged in la or i don't know what happened there but um because i'm trying to remember where it actually took place did it actually take place at coachella maybe two places i don't know what happened anyway regardless some, somehow he got charged in london and la for the same crime um so the case in LA got dropped because the um, the accuser didn't want to give any evidence. I'm assuming she didn't want to go to LA to give evidence. I don't know how that specifically works. But I'm not sure if the case in London is still pending because when when ASAP Bari did a layover in London, he got arrested at London Airport uh, because of his outstanding warrant. So now, because the case has been dropped in LA, ASAP Bari is now, the story has come out that he's actually uh, suing his accuser for um, defamation, I'm assuming, right? The article's come up here. I'm going to show it. I think it's like a an article that I saw online actually might have been Reddit. Let me click the whole thing here. Let's get up on here. One second. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, here we go. Blah, blah, blah. So here we go. Um, oh, some pitch for actually. It's that Barry Sue sexual assault accuser, right? Which is an interesting turn of events. So the article goes as following. ASAP Barry sues sexual assault accuser for defamation, right? Um, Jabari Shelton, better known as ASAP Mob, uh, co-founder ASAP Barry, has sued the woman who accused him of sexually assaulting her in July 2017, TMZ reports, right? Um, according to the report, Shelton claims that uh, the woman uh, referred to as Jane Doe, which is annoying, isn't it? Like, that's a part of the thing I hate about this sort of thing, right? I don't know if who's I don't know who's in the right or wrong, right? I don't know if... Uh, Bari actually did what they say he did. I don't know if the girl's lying. I don't know what's happening, right? But this thing of like, I guess because I guess Barry was fucked because the video got out, right? The video got out and that kind of showed what he did. But why is why is the girl's name being protected in this whole affair? Especially if like if somehow they were friends and they've kind of amicably settled things, or um, she just panicked and kind of wanted to get a, uh, get involved in the conversation with the whole Me Too stuff and kind of just said, yeah, I got sexual assault and then kind of regretted it later. Whatever, I don't mind, right? But why why is a girl being granted anonymity and he isn't? Like, I don't understand it. Why is there no media blackout on him, but there's a media blackout on the girl? But anyway, the report refers to as Jane Doe told police officers that on the night of the alleged incident that she he did not that he did not sexually assault her. Sheldon is reportedly suing the woman for defamation and civil extortion for allegedly pursuing him into settling, which basically, you know, might go to was might go to the theory that I saw a lot of people saying where she was just saying it was sexual assault because they were friends. She knew he would kind of settle out of court and kind of keep her quiet. 
So um, again, like bribery in it in its fullest. Um, the video of the alleged incident surfaced in July 2017. Shelton called a misleading video clip shortly after the incident came to light. Nike cut ties with Shelton fashion label Vlone, which is which was really again which was really sad because that was during when he did the whole like Paris Fashion Week show with little peep and stuff, right? And everyone was kind of raving about the designs, and he had that little black jean jacket and the amazing jeans or whatever. So it didn't. I mean, it came at such a, such a bad time for him. Months later, which I guess bad time for the girl too. I guess if she got assaulted um, again, um, please excuse me. I don't know who's who's telling the truth here. Months later. In November 2017, a woman sued Shelton for over one million. In May 2018, Shelton was arrested. Oh gosh, she's sued him for one million. Arrested in London, where the alleged incident occurred. Okay, it did occur on two counts sexual assault. In other Isaac Barry related news, last week the Hollywood Reporter reported that the district attorney had dropped the claim to pursue the sexual assault case related to the alleged incident. Blah blah. blah the claim. Kind of, uh, so, I don't know what to think about this, right? Um. <laughs> I guess if it's to be if it's to be believed, right? Because again, like all we can, the only thing that we can go in is the video. Barry says it's misleading, right? But if we watch the video, right? If hundred people watch the video, I think ninety nine of us will all agree that what Barry did it was fucked up, right? I don't think that's cool. Um, maybe in the hood, there's different. Um, there's different kind of etiquette when it comes to girls. I understand that, but it, it's still not cool, right? It's still not cool. Um, number one, why is his friend in the room video recording, right? Um, relaxed, which is weird. Number two, there's Bari in the room. So there's three guys in the room and one girl. They're not having a threesome. It's just two other guys just standing around in the room, which is really strange, right? Uh, maybe if, you're, if your friend kind of like peeked in and kind of like poured water over you whilst you're in the bed with a girl. Again, it's annoying. Okay, all this stuff's annoying. All this stuff's really annoying. And you kind of would want to punch your friend in the face. But if someone did that to you, you would find it funny, maybe, right? It would be a bit funny, be a bit of a prank, be a bit humorous, right? You're one of your friends running in and maybe pulling off the covers on the bed while you're in bed with somebody. I get it. But two guys in the room, one video recording and the other one uh, in Bari kind of like moaning that the girl isn't kind of doing him any sexual favors. I think most of us can agree that that wasn't a good thing he did, right? That was kind of fucked up. Not kind of all the way fucked up, right? But the kind of issue that I have with this case is that the girl was very quick to drop the case, right? In, in general, right? Because nowadays, in the current climate that we're in, she's kind of got the advantage because most people are of the are kind of adopt the stance of believe all women, right? Even if the case, even if there's no evidence being pursued, because you know for the most part everyone's being judged in a court of public opinion. No one really has their day in court. For the most part, everyone kind of settles out of court and settling out of court. You have no idea whether or not the stories. You have no idea what what the truth is because sometimes. Your, even your own lawyer would advise you to settle out of court because sometimes going to trial might bring up other shit that, you, that no one knew about. Do you know what I mean? Like real secrets. So sometimes settling out of court could just be something that you do just to kind of avoid any trouble, avoid getting yourself any sort of, like, any sort of um, unnecessary trouble and bringing your family any sort of unnecessary stress. So don't pay too much mind to that. But there's also an aspect of it that is like, maybe let's, let's, do, let's put the scenario that they're friends, all of them in the room. They're all friends, right? Because I think the one person we have to blame really who's got who should be getting a lot of the blame, who Barry should there be directing most of his ire to, right, is the guy recording it. Because he's the one that released the video. He's the one that put it up on his fucking Instagram stories, right? That kid is the fucking dickhead. He's the one that's an idiot, right? Because without that video on Instagram stories, no one gets in trouble, right? It's an issue of like that girl running away and being distraught. She probably cusses him out, tells him he's a dickhead, like tells him not to do that ever again, and they kind of carry on being friends. Which never part, which never happens anymore, right? No one ever just like what happened to just what happened to being friends with girls? Because sometimes you know it's hard for boys and girls to be um, to be kind of like um, platonic friends. It's very difficult, right? That sexual tension exists for most people, right? Uh, most people can't have se platonic sex um, female friends. I know I can't sometimes, right? Depending on who the person is, I know I, I struggle to do that as well. So if you struggle to have sexual, if you struggle to have platonic female friends, you have to be aware that sometimes they might be, especially if the guy that you're friends with is a bit of a loose cannon or whatever it may be. There might be an occasion where sometimes someone might do something that might overstep the mark, right? But you have to be, because that's what a friendship is, right? Sometimes you might argue with your friends, right? You might have a really big argument with your friends and you might come to blows or you might say things to your friends that no one else, has, no one else, um, so your friend might say something to you that no one has ever said to, to you in your whole life, right? Really cut deep, whatever. But your friends, you're going to get over it. Especially if you're friends, you will kind of get over it eventually. So why isn't there that same level of, um, um, 
give or leeway accepted when it comes to people uh, with these kind of uh, sexual assault missteps or whatever it may be called, quote unquote. Especially when it's someone that doesn't have a history of touching up people, right? If it's someone that's just like a one-off thing, like, I don't know, they got the wrong signal and they kind of lower their hand down that person's back. What happened to just like giving that guy a slap, cussing him out, telling him that's not cool, uh, not talking to him for a week, uh, two weeks, a month, and then later on being friends? Why does it suddenly have to go from like touching my back Maybe saying something in the in in it on the um at the actual moment, but also going to the police, also going to the press, like trying to ruin the person's life on social media by post by doing one of those like third person posts, like I'm not gonna name my accuser, but I'm just gonna say what you did wasn't cool, and then everyone kind of finds out who it is and kind of pillars you, and you lose everything. I don't understand why we haven't got to a point where someone could just do something that's wrong, right? That's wrong that we can all agree is wrong. Like Barry away did was wrong, but as friends we can kind of just sit down and say, hey, I know I fucked up the other day. I'm sorry. No, we can all kind of like get on with it. And then we can decide there and then if we want to be friends or not. But it doesn't happen anymore. It just goes all the way straight to the end. Like everyone just kind of loses shit. Like luckily, Barry works for himself and has his own brand. And if anything, the controversy weirdly kind of helped his part of infamy or whatever. But he kind of lost his quote unquote Nike deal, which he hasn't really lost, which I've heard through the grapevine. He hasn't really lost. Um, they kind of like cut, he cut ties with him like in public. So they, wanna, they didn't want to be exposed. Um, sort of like what happened to Rick Ross with the whole Reebok deal. Um, and he still got kind of like, he's still getting seeded. He's still getting shoes. Um, he's still getting g given shoes for shoots and stuff. Like it's not really uh, cutting off of all ties. It's kind of like, you know, they kind of want to uh, let the dust settle. And plus, you know, having like five sexual accusers, f f five sexual assaulters that like, just left Nike recently because of the kind of culture they're breeding there. Uh, Phil Knight had to write some massive internal memo about them changing the culture. Like, you know, they're not the first, they can't really throw stones. But he lost quite a lot of it, right? He lost probably a lot of face in the industry. People thinking that he is a sexual abuser. Like, you know, you kind of have to, op he kind of operates as a little, as kind of like a lone soldier for the most part. All those kind of social media friends that he had, like, you know, you know the kind of people that are on Instagram that he kind of speaks to. They don't really, if you notice, like, they don't really post about him too much, right? Ian Connor has been posted about recently, but you don't really see people posting that much about uh, um, Barry himself. They might post... Uh, wearing his clothes but they don't really post about him anymore which is you know a bit annoying i'd assume because everyone's your mate and you get accused of things everyone kind of like leaves you in the dust so again if this story is true then i can kind of understand um bari going for the skill right if like they were friends he kind of apologized she she said oh, it's okay the story got into the press because everyone saw the video um it, it kind of gained new legs the girl kind of actually thought you know what actually i changed my mind i'm not cool with it uh, took legal action uh went to the police um settled out of court he gave us some money to kind of like uh, keep it quiet or for it to not for it to not to continue not to not go to trial and then it suddenly transpires that she doesn't want to give evidence she doesn't want to go to the full way through he's like you know what fuck this man i'm gonna sue you, Do you know what i mean i need to i need to kind of get better respect back on my name but unfortunately these kind of defamation cases they're not going to do anything to change people's minds some people's minds are made up some people are just gonna be like nah he did it I mean, I remember when the story broke, people saying that he raped the girl. Like, that's rape. It's not rape. You watch the videos, that isn't rape. He didn't penetrate her in any sort of way. He did, what he did was shitty. What he did was super creepy and really out of order. And I wouldn't, I don't think I'd be friends with anyone in my, anyone in my circle of friends if someone did that, right? I don't think I have friends that would come into my room whilst I was fucking some girl and kind of take the cover off and fi and filming us some video and put up Instagram stories. Like, that's not something that I, I would want to do. Not so, I'm not part of that kind of friendship group, but if that is what they do and they, that's how they get down their friendship, group like there should be some sort of like understanding between each other like okay cool you fucked up right let's have a talk about it let's kind of settle this as friends and move on but you know suing somebody taking this to the police suing someone then not going through with the with, with the with the charges you know like maybe you should be um you should be taken to court and you know that this defamation case it is it is going to be exposed it is it will expose bari too i'm sure some i'm sure if uh, the girl does seek legal counsel they're going to be you know they're going to attack him too and kind of like dig into his past and get into the things that he's done but it seems like he doesn't care i mean he needs to get he's kind of needs to get his name back in that respect so interesting story i guess again lessons to be learned from this from everyone watching everyone involved in the scene anyone with a bit of clout who has kind of who's kind of has um a following behind them who, who is maybe getting you know unsolicited um offers from um the opposite sex or whoever you're interested in be careful out there man be careful um and you know just be a gentleman too that i feel like that's something that's being overlooked in the industry just be a gentleman be a gentleman man like don't treat girls like shit like treat them with respect even if you are just gonna be fucking for one night even if it is just gonna be them just coming around and, and i don't know i don't know jimmy sucking your dick or whatever it may be treat them with respect man 
I treat them with respect. Uh, don't sell them any fake dreams. If you don't, if you don't want that person to be your girlfriend, let them know. Let them know what it is, and then go from there. I think most of the stuff is just coming from the lack of respect these guys have for women in general. You know what I mean? That's what breeze is kind of weird contempt where you can come into a room and rip a duvet off someone that's you know just just got to just finish having sex. It's, it's not really cool. So I think that's something a lot of people should kind of take heed on and do for the future so again i don't know what's gonna happen it's never part of the case it's gonna keep on rumbling on but again i'm gonna mind my own business because again it's nothing to do with me but i think lesson to be learned from this is just treat respect treat, treat women with respect man even the ones that are interested in even the hoey ones even the ones that don't mind coming to your hotel room and fucking you after a music concert because everyone's free to do what they want just treat them with respect i think that's that's the main 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 takeaway of this whole shebang anyway what's next on the topic list here um Drake design. Oh, shit, have you seen this? So during the whole um, Drake and the Migos on tour, right? Drake and the Migos are on tour and the fucking stage design looks incredible. Um, the last real majorly incredible thing we must have saw, was it maybe from Kanye? Drake again with the views, with the massive thing that he did. Uh, oh, um, Kendrick Lamar did a really good one too for his damn tour, like a whole Kung Fu Kenny theme. Big Sean did a really amazing one too during his performances. Everyone's kind of stepping up their level, especially the A-listers, right? And another big thing too that Drake has done, no backing track, no vocal backing track. So he's singing these songs and it's just him and an instrumental, quote unquote, playing in the background. But the actual stage design is amazing. It's sort of like a big, I'm not gonna, what, what could it be? It might just be like a rectangle hologram cube, right? That they're kind of like projecting images onto it and it's moving around 3d so I'll, I'll just show you what it looks like i'm sure some of you guys have seen it on instagram and stuff but it looks fucking insane it looks so so cool i saw it on this forum i think they kind of like did a roundup of all the of all the things on there but let me try and see if i can get it up now blah blah, blah. No, let me do a little wednesday spa cup why not let me just get this up here now kansas city okay first part of the tour Mm -mm. Oh yeah, Wednesday Spark Cup. Come on, load, load, load. Shut some of these windows down. This computer is awfully slow, isn't it? But yeah, it's a really good production. Um, I think a lot. Maybe the, some of the SoundCloud kids that I'm a big fan of. That's the only part that really lets me down about these guys. I mean, their their stage shows are so shit. Like, I'm not really, I'm not, I don't really go to their state, to their performances to see, like, an amazing lighting or, do you know what I mean, like, all that sort of stuff. But I at least want to see, um, what do I want to see? I just want to, I just want to hear the music, do you know what I mean? I want to hear you rapping and singing over your tracks. I don't, I, I want to hear you rapping and singing along to your track. I don't want to hear you rapping over the vocal that I already have on my, on my phone. It doesn't make any sense. That's anything that's kind of annoying about these guys. But, yeah, this performance looks amazing. Hopefully I can load up on the screen. Hope you guys can see it. So yeah, um, here we go. It's playing now. Can you guys see this? You see that? Hope you guys can see that. You can hear that. Performing mob ties. Let's get it up on here. So if I'm sure if you can kind of see it, it's sort of like a weird cube, isn't it? See that? Okay, cool. That might not be a good one. Let me let me get the one I saw with the mobile phone. It's uh, for in my, in my feelings. It looked fucking insane. So he's dancing on top of mobile phones, right? Where is it? Um, there we go. Here it is, right? So the, the I don't know sure how they've done this design wise. It looks fucking insane. It looks so cool. Look at this. Hopefully you guys can see this, right? I'll link again. I'll link it on the show notes. so amazing isn't it so do you think so man that looks fucking insane i don't know how they did it like he's basically essentially if you're not watching the video he's dancing on top of an iphone 6 screen an iphone x screen so they've kind of designed the so it's basically like a hologram cube like a rectangle platform and then um 
they can kind of uh, project images. I'm assuming digital images onto that screen to make it look like a certain thing. But they can also project images around it. So it's sort of like got like lasers. I'm assuming so probably lasers that like make it into a cube. Because I saw there was an image of him kind of rapping and there's a Ferrari in a, in the, in the clouds. It looks absolutely insane performance wise. So again, that tour looks fucking incredible. Drake's voice sounds a bit ropey there, but I don't care because he's actually singing a song. Because again, it's, it comes across a bit weird listening to it at home because someone's recording um, the the performance through their phone and you're listening to it again through your computer it kind of loses a bit of the stuff plus it's not you're not in the actual room you're not hearing it through the actual speakers it doesn't sound as ropey as it is but i kind of like hearing him sound out of breath and something be like you know aren't you that's what a live performance should sound like not just not him just shouting on top of the actual vocal track itself which is super fucking annoying but yeah um um was it it's thinking it's aubrey and the and the amigos right so on tour something like that with drake and the amigos the tour kind of is currently on now hopefully they come to london I can't wait to see those guys. But yeah, that stage design looks fucking incredible. Anyway, next on the docket. Let's run through this shit. Um, oh, Supreme all, all, all in 2018. How can I forget about that? The Supreme drop, the Supreme collection dropped um, just the other day, the preview. And everyone's kind of going crazy over the usual stuff on there. Um, there's so much things. There's quite a few bits and bobs that I want to buy from the old collection. I'm going to kind of put up on the site. I'm going to put up actually on the screen so you guys can see. Um, again, I'm a big fan of Supreme. I always will be. I'm not sure. If, I think um, Jeff Staple mentioned it on the Bobby Hundreds podcast on the on a, a podcast with Bobby and um, Ben Hundreds that he's not sure whether or not they're gonna continue to be a cool brand, right? Because they've got like investment in it. They've got they've now been they've now taken on outside investment, and you know it's kind of been like a quote unquote case study of like what what it is to be a modern brand if a modern brand can survive investment because most brands don't, right? Uh, investment comes in, your brand kind of gets slowly but surely gets watered down. The people that originally are, are were behind it kind of get a bit disillusioned with the whole thing and pull away and do something else but um i think so far so good um i'm not i don't think we've seen a real dip in the quality of supreme if anything the only thing that we have seen is that this over reliance on branding which kind of like goes into what the kind of kids want nowadays there's a lot of like supreme being splattered across places um in an back in the day when sometimes they would have just probably put a little pull tab a little red tab on there or sometimes the tonal tab with supreme on there nowadays they're kind of opting for like really big branding on the back of shorts on the front of shorts maybe to kind of like you know maximize coverage on like street style websites and all that sort of stuff but you know that's the only part that i can really see has been a bit diluted but for the most part the things that i go to supreme for the basics and the outerwear are still some of the best and then another wild card that i think a lot of people don't really give chris supreme enough credit for are pants and trousers like they make really good jeans really good chinos really good uh chore trousers like paint or paint kind of trousers they make they make really really good ones so um, there's a lot of having a collection that I like. I'm gonna highlight some bits and bobs. I'm gonna get up on the screen for you listening on the podcast. It's gonna be a bit, um, what you call it? It won't be of any sense, but I'll kind of be able to try and be as descriptive as I can. So, um, looking on the preview of this site now, I think I like this trench. I like this. Um, of course, I like this. Um, what else? And click the things that I like and then kind of like talking to talk about them a little bit. So let's go into the first three things. So number one thing that I think is really nice and I would love to get in the Supreme Collection is a wool trench coat. So it's kind of comes in an orange and I think a black, right? Is it orange or a black or an orange and a kind of charcoal color? And it looks fucking insane. Both colors are amazingly nice. Um, which is interesting because uh, they've been making, they've been taking a lot of things in-house. I remember seeing an interview or reading an interview with J James Jebbia and he's kind of asking about why he worked with the North Face and the whole idea behind it was that um, the North Face are the experts of making uh, technical outerwear, right? So he'd rather go to someone who's an expert um, and work with them in order to produce something than produce a subpar version of it. But it seems like they've they're doing less and less of that nowadays they've kind of like taken a lot of things that they kind of outsourced to other brands and bringing it in in-house for instance this trench they could easily have made it with scott they could have easily made it with um another what's the british brand macintosh or something they could easily made it with a, a host of other brands right but they've kind of kept it in-house which kind of goes to show that they're kind of you know their r d is getting a lot better and able to kind of produce things at a higher level especially different types of style of clothing and i think this trench looks fucking amazing so it's uh, Lorna, Lorna piano wall with power lining and buttons on the front and hand pockets lower. So I think it's really nice. The orange is probably my kind of go-to color. It kind of reminds me of a kind of a Raph Simmons sort of jacket because I think you can get that gray kind of color in most places again. Because I think, you know, if you're going to buy a Supreme jacket, 
out of a piece, I think it's probably interesting to kind of get something that isn't, you don't really necessarily see from other brands. And I guess that kind of really amazing orange kind of color trench is something that you wouldn't see. I love this Scotch jacket because it reminds me of, oh, what's his fucking name? And the, the former designer of number nine. He's kind of got a similar sort of like, he kind of does a similar sort of thing where he kind of uh, cuts, like cuts, um, he kind of like glues and patches things together from other jackets and makes them into other things. So again, MA1 and kind of like reconstruct it, like turn sleeves inside out, turn an in, a inseam out, uh, put the sleeve upside down, like loads of really cool things. I really like how this is made. So it's kind of got like a leather waistcoat on the outside a leather down vest and uh, obviously a, a puffer jacket on the inside it looks fucking incredible if anything it's like a better version of the balenciaga puffer jacket a lot of people were wearing um a few seasons back um it looks really really cool again probably go for the yellow or if anything go for the gray just to kind of like mix it up a little bit so that, that was really nice um and next thing i'd recommend I'd, or something that i want to really buy i think this is going to be my kind of got my kind of number one piece that i'm going to try and get during this collection especially for the winter months is it's this gore-tex uh 700 phil dan parker it's something that they've done a few seasons um uh, a few seasons now so that kind of like what's it called is it down is that it's that new york jacket that a lot of people it's kind of got a really big history in new york city because a lot of um, stick up boys were jacking people for these jackets back in the day um, so they've now kind of made a version of, of, of their own, which is incredibly puffy. I think they've done a few. They've done like a camera version that Playboy Carti wore in a video um, recently or in a few videos ago. They've got another another few versions. I think a black version that Kanye wore a few times before that. And now they've got this version that's kind of comes in the green. But again, the only thing that I'm not a fan of is the fucking Supreme on the back of the hood. Right, the outline supreme is a little bit annoying, but you know, say la vie, anything you have to kind of go with. But I like both colors. I like this color, this kind of like uh, dusty black, which kind of reminds me of like Rick Owens or Yeezy sort of like color palette. But again, I think if I had to go with it, I'd have to probably go for the green, um, just to kind of you know differentiate the kind of color scheme. But I think it looks amazing. It kind of oh, it comes in black as well, actually. So that would be an interesting kind of piece to kind of pick up. I'm not sure which one I'd go for, but those three jackets looking fucking insane. I love them both um those that was my pick what has been something i've been interested in of course the long sleeves are really nice there's this is pretty a little bit of a wild card that i thought was really cool too this um these two actually put the vest and this is an interesting piece too because this i've been at again goes proves my point that maybe supreme have really upped the ante with their whole r d and they've kind of got a lot better at making their own thing this jacket could easily be a collab with um stone island right um this reflective camo down jacket um, a reflective printed poly with down fill and a full zip closure, a packable hood with hand pockets and a lower front and jacket logo zipper and a tape at the hood. So it looks a lot like something that um, Stone Island would happily make for Supreme, but they've kind of brought it in-house. So it's a kind of basically a 3M, a reflective uh, down jacket in camo, right, which looks a lot like a lot, a lot like the stuff like uh, Stone Island would do. Um, so again, it maybe go to show that maybe they're limiting, they're kind of like pulling back on the on the collabos maybe for since the investment they're kind of um, focusing on developing their own line of stuff instead of like collaborating and splitting the profits i'm not too sure but this looks really nice i, I like this i think a lot of the kids are going to be a fan of this um this vest is really cool too the guns um shop vest again these vests that supreme make are always a no-brainer they fit really well nice real boxy fit in them so if, you, if you're someone that is a fan of wearing the whole vest with a t-shirt and big um, dickies and a pair of vans or some converse, there's probably a thing for you to go for. Um, and again, this um, snowflake toggle fleece jacket, again, snowflake jacket, I'm not sure if it's like a political uh, theme upon that, like calling people snowflakes and stuff, but I like this piece. There's another really interesting piece about it. Again, um, the logo branding on the front chest is probably something that I'm not a fan of. I think in years gone by, this probably wouldn't have been there, but you know, something you, something you have to kind of live with. And again, nice colors. I think it looks really nice, really comfy sort of piece. And a couple of other pieces before I kind of wrap up. It would be, oh, why did I forget this? Fucking quilted flannel. I've got a lot of these things, right? I'm sure a lot of people would probably uh, cringe at the fact that I'm checking out another flannel, right? But I'm going to click that. And I'm also going to click, um, I'm also going to click some hats. What's hat that I saw that I really liked? I'm actually going to steal this as an, as an idea for something I want to do, right? So I saw these trooper hats I thought were really cool. And I also saw... And I also thought this was really nice too. Where is it? The one with the quotes on the front. Where's that hat here? Can I find it? I'm not sure everyone else does the same thing I do when I look at this list. But I like to look at them all like this. There's a whole bunch. And of course... Yeah, so let me stick to that and I'll go to the miscellaneous items. So, number one other thing that I liked here was uh, the pile line flannel uh, flannel shirt. 
and um, this quilted shirt. Right? I've now got a few of these things, and Balenciaga made one that I still haven't worn yet. I'm waiting to wear during the winter months, but these things are amazing. They've got they've got snap buttons right instead of um, actual buttons on them, so it's gonna be nice to wear. The power lining um, colors of the flannel are pretty nice. I'll probably go for the purple. It's kind of mix things up purple or this green in the middle or purple actually orange those are two of my favorite colors there right so that's really nice the pile lining that they kind of use the same sometimes they use a the pile for use it in coach jackets and things um and then they've got the quilted uh padded shirt that looks a little bit familiar um to like the looks a little bit more similar to the balenciaga flannel shirt but maybe a little bit more of a dyed out wash on the whole tartan itself really really nice again a uh, pattern and the colors look amazing i'd probably again go for that um, the kind of this color at the front, this color at the back here, they're sort of like washed out blue and then kind of probably this black as well, kind of go for that. But they look really, really nice. I have to, admit, I have to really say, um, I'm not sure if it's that's a, that's a straight. There's no, yeah, I like how they do it at the bottom too. This, it doesn't have the loop, it's just kind of cut straight, which I really like as well. Um, and then this cardigan is really nice, plaid front zip flannel. Um, I'm sure a lot of the those kind of ASAP Nas guys will probably wear this kind of thing. It's really, it looks really comfy. I like this thing. It reminds me of a jumper that I bought from Uniqlo back in the day that I lost a kind of little fleece that I had. But I like the kind of collar it's got at the top. So that would be something that I'm sure would be quite popular with kids because I'm not sure that whole granny look is really in it. That whole 90s granny look with big Levi's and Converse and shits. So I might be in. Um, and then obviously the Gore-Tex Trooper jackets. Um, the Gore-Tex Trooper hats to match the jackets look fucking insane. Um, I'm, so, I'm, I'm bummed they didn't make uh, the down jacket actually, the 700 in this pattern. This looks really cool, innit? They didn't put it in this pattern. Maybe it's going to come out later or maybe they couldn't make it. Um, they couldn't get the level of quality that they wanted and put that, they decided not to put it in production. Or maybe we're going to see it later down the line, but the trip hats always look good. I've got a couple of them. I've lost a couple, actually, so it might be time to reinvest in one. And there's something that fit my big head. And, of course, fitting, talking about big heads, these snapback um, mesh caps are looks amazing, man, um, with uh, John 316 quotes on the front. Of the mesh kind of foam back of it they look really cool and i think i'm gonna i'm gonna jack this idea and make it for my own brand and put kind of like stoic quotes in the front of this so if you see me making them yes i'm copying supreme yes i'm copying supreme anyway moving on to um miscellaneous item because these are some of the things that a lot of people like as well with supreme they talk about quite often number one i like the backpack i like the bike um what else i like i like the scales of course um i like the marker and last but not least i think that might be it for now yeah let me just go on those things this so uh the backpack looks great i've kind of not bought a spring back out in a long time because i usually make an effort to try and buy some on yahoo jp and buy like old school backpacks like you know the um, 40 thieves ones you know that kind of those kind of legendary backpacks kind of like you can kind of buy a lot of those things new for under 200 pounds which is fucking amazing uh price for something that's going to last you you know decades and decades but this backpack is really nice. I really like the look of it. I'm not sure what that sign is there. If that's a logo, if that's like a collab or just their new logo for backpacks. What does it say on the description? The backpack dimensions, Polynate VX2 R4S41. Oh, it's a fabric. Maybe it's a fabric um, collaboration they do work with, with free and reflective printed on the logo and front panel. This looks really nice. I like the look of it. Again, I'll probably go for the purple just to kind of mix things up a little bit because I've had a black pack, a black backpack for most of my life. Um, and then of course the the bike looks super cool, right? I'm sure a lot of people are gonna try and get their hands on the on the bike. It's probably gonna be bucks, right? Maybe a couple of grand. But it looks really, really cool as well. Supreme Santa Cruz Chameleon. Is this is this the kind of bike that those kids in the city ride to do uh when they're gonna do wheelies and shit? Or is this like a real like mountain bike? I'm not sure. But it looks really full, cool. I'm not really a fan of these kind of jumpy jumpy bikes in general, by the way, but you know, it looks nice. I like it. Um and then, of course, the scales, man. For anyone, you know, for anyone that's about this life, and, you know, I'm sure some of us have a few of these scales dotting around that house that we use to measure loads of herbs and spices. This is fucking cool. Like, only Supreme could do something like this, man. Jeremy is so, so amazing. That'd be something I'm going to try and get my hands on. And then, last but not least, the marker pens. In an era where everyone's kind of marking their shoes and colouring them and writing quotes on the side of their shoes, a la Tom Sachs and Virgil Abloh, these are going to be something that's going to be probably really popular a lot of people are they permanent markers yeah they're permanent markers so they're going to be a lot popular with a lot of people so you're not going to be able to write on a board with them but loads of things are supreme i'm think i'm pretty sure the first drop is going to be this friday i think so right let me go back to the news and see what they say about it i'm pretty sure it's this friday right everything's dropping the the, the question will be available in japan and 18th and online the 25th 
Oh, it's gonna be no, it's gonna be available. The season our shop will reopen on Monday, the twenty fifth of August in the US and EU. Okay, cool. That's all right. And we can resume resume on Thursday. That's nice. So everything's dropping. Everything's coming out soon. They've got lookbook which I haven't actually checked out to see what looks great because I don't actually care about lookbook anymore these days. Not sure if anyone who does anyone still check the lookbook out. I don't really, but yeah, everything looks really nice. I like that again. The tre- the trench looks really cool. As always, I like that graphic on the back of that jacket. Yeah, that Scott jacket is fucking hard as balls, mate. Hard as balls. Scotch and that Scotch kind of leather jacket. Um, puffer leather. That's really cool. I love that tracksuit. The down jacket is going to get cop. Doesn't look as puffy as it should do in there, does it? But I'm sure it's going to be okay. Um, yeah, loads of cool pieces as always, man. Supreme always smash it when it comes to autumn winter. That's, that's their like go-to season. So if you're a big fan of theirs, and I'm assuming you will be aware of this and you're going to go buy something. If not, then maybe you won't care and you're going to say, what are these kids fucking doing? But you're missing out, of course. Anyway, that might be a good place to end the Action Zinger show. We're at, what is it, an hour 30 on something, maybe one of the longest I've done so far. Um, again, thanks so much for tuning in to episode number 95 of the Action Zinger show. It's been amazing talking to you guys. Um, I'll see you guys again next week. Um, so I guess have the good rest of the rest of the week and, you know, take care of yourselves and whatnot. Um, for my, what am I getting up to this weekend? Great question. Number one, I'm DJing at Tap East on Friday, um, for a night called Tapped. So me alongside my good friend, Afro Musa, uh, she'll be playing from five. I'll jump on the decks till seven, from seven until close. So if you're in the area in Westwood Stratford and you want to have a drink, have a boogie, come down and hang with your boy. And then on Saturday, I'm hanging out with the brunette and her brother who's coming to visit. So we're going to go to the city, hang out, check some shit, eat some food and stuff. So that should be good. Oh, actually working in the morning before that, get some work out of the way. And then from there, go out and hang out with um, the family. And then in the evening, I'm heading off to Fold. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it. I'm going to actually get something on the screen now. Um, Resident Advisor. What's it? Fold Nightclub Resident Advisor. Let's see here. I'm heading out on Saturday evening. I'm heading out to Fold Nightclub to for the first dance for the because fold is i'm sure you're aware i mentioned loads of times is london's first 24-hour nightclub and it's finally launching finally we've got 24-hour nightclub launching on the 18th so i'm gonna go head over there heading over to fold on saturday night until sunday morning so if you're in the area and you want to come have a boogie please do fold nightclub fold 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 nightclub i repeat that again for the first dance hopefully i got it so no let me get up on the screen actually get up on the screen i'm heading up to fold nightclub here Loads of good DJs playing. DJs on the night will be Dimension Sound System, Global Global Root Sound System, Test Pressing Sound System. So loads of promoters in shops and stuff. Uh, Gold Snap, Left Alone, Opulence, Rhesus Dance, um, Homo Drop London, Body Motion, Snap Crackle and Pop, Make Me, Chaos, Ear to the Ground, World Unknown, Utini, uh, um, G Dance, Possession, Body Hammer, IBHTX, Fold. Everyone's playing. It's going to be fucking amazing. I cannot wait for it to happen. So that's what I'm going to do on my Saturday. And then Sunday is going to be spent most of the time nursing a hangover and chilling the fuck out. So I've got an action-packed weekend ahead of me. So I guess for everyone out there, enjoy your weekend. Take care of those around you. Kiss and hug your closest friends. And I will see you guys again very soon. Peace.